6. 1 Corinthians 6, as we're moving through this letter that Paul wrote to the church that he established in Corinth. It was there 16 months. And he has been lovingly, apostolically, giving them a good evangelical spanking for six chapters now. Having opened the letter to acknowledge that they are the church of God in Corinth, he sets forth to address things that have come to him uh, that have not pleased him because he knows it does not please God. And So we've, we've given this, the overarching theme to this study through 1 Corinthians, the perfect gospel for an imperfect church. We sang a song or two today that uh, and read from, from uh, Ephesians 1, this very, uh, very intentional Trinitarian context of salvation. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit working in concert, in harmony to accomplish salvation. You're going you're gonna to see a notion of that here as we read through this passage today. 1 Corinthians 6, looking and thinking about how your life, my life, is meant for God. Stand with me if you would, if you found that a passage in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you uh, so that everybody can gaze upon the Word. My words are not guaranteed not to return void. God's Word, when observed, taken in, his word that goes forth from his mouth that is attended by his spirit, we have the promise it will not return void. So you follow along if you would, please. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, let us know. We want to do what we can to get you, get a Bible in your hands. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord, and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord help us to understand what Paul is saying, to see, see the big picture. Let us not think that we can dodge the bullet of this passage by simply saying, well, Pastor, this is good news. I'm not consorting with a prostitute. Uh, there's, there's a lot here we need to consider and be sure that our mindset is such that we were made for God. And if we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, then we do not belong to ourselves anymore. We're not ours. We're His. Thank you. Please be seated. You'll remember last week we looked at verses 9 through 11 and, and looked at this, uh, this tragedy that was going on in Corinth and around Corinth. And we talked about it last week about how it's the tragedy going on and around us today. Immorality abounds in the land. Every week I read things that just make, you know, you would think, okay, you're, you're a pretty old fellow preacher, nothing should surprise you, but I just gasp. I gasp. I read, maybe in this morning, in California, enough said, uh, 
a first grader was sent to the principal's office because this first grader made the mistake of using the wrong pronoun to speak to a fellow student who has undergone the transgender process. First grade. Brothers and sisters, what is happening in America today would have made the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah blush. So we live in a society that if it was bad in Corinth, and it was bad in Corinth, we talked to you about that. Corinth, if you wanted to insult a woman in the first century in that part of the world, you called her a Corinthian woman. Because there was a temple there that had temple prostitutes, and immorality was the order of the day. As bad as Corinth was, the Corinthians would today to insult a woman, call her an American woman. So we need, to, we need to learn from this. Be sure that we know whose we are and in the light of that know who the Lord would have us to be. So in verse 9, he, he had warned the Corinthians against being deceived. Be not deceived, he said. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. He talked about that, we looked at last week. He dealt with the subject of impurity, specifically sexual impur impurity. He's not off of that yet. The emphasis on deception, the danger of being deceived, and, and you're going to see in a minute here, we talked last week about why that would have been occurring in Corinth and, and how it is occurring here today. He enters into this subject. And what he's talking about here is... When we're saved by grace through faith, we're delivered from the bondage of the devil. We are set free, the scripture talks about, being set free from the bondage of sin and death. But the freedom we experience when, as we sing, in, uh, and can it be, long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound by sin in nature's night, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flame with light, my chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and if we were going to rewrite that hymn to fit this present culture, I rose, went forth, and did whatsoever I darn well pleased. No, I rose, went forth, and followed thee, amazing love. So the freedom we have is not a freedom to say, oh, isn't it wonderful I'm not going to hell. No, it's a freedom to live as if we're on our way to heaven. So they were twisting the meaning of salvation by grace and the Christian liberty that is a reality as an appeal to live immorally. You say, that couldn't possibly be true. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it's true. It's true today. If you're... If you're not in the trenches, if you, know, if you don't know somebody who claims to be a Christian but is living in immorality with another person, Christian or not, then I'm amazed because I bump into way too many people like that. And I get phone calls from church members who are in churches where that's going on. And they ask me, what... Isn't there something to be done about that? I get phone calls from pastors who find out that's going on. And say, how do, we, how do we address this? Well, that's Corinth. So I want you to see in this, these few minutes we have together here, three things from this passage. First of all, my life is not really mine. Secondly, my life belongs to God. Third, my life is intended to glorify God. So we have in verse 12 here that this idea that my life is not really mine. All things are lawful for me, Paul says in verse 12, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Now, we don't know exactly, and your, your Bible uh, versions may have quotes around this. So we don't know, is Paul declaring something that's true uh, of, the, of the Christian faith, that the, I know, the implications of freedom in Christ? 
Or is he quoting something that comes out of Corinth? And it's just difficult to know. Probably he is, he is quoting back to them, all things are lawful for me. So he, this is something the Corinthians would say uh, in the Corinthian church. Well, look, we've been set free by Christ. There's no condemnation. We're in Christ. Everything's permissible. Maybe they're twisting something Paul had taught them about Christian liberty during the 18 months he spent at Corinth. You know, we're coming up on the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. I'm just going to remind you that when we hit, when we hit the end of September, Sunday night, heading into all the month of October, we're going to begin to take in uh, and look at the five, uh, the five onlys, the five solas of the Reformation because we need to re rediscover those things today. Uh, and Martin Luther, who was the, the f father of that, who, who unwittingly started that by nailing the 95 theses, the 95 points of contention he had with the Roman Catholic Church of the day. If you've read Martin Luther at all, you know he will say some crazy things. I mean, some things that make you go, mm. And if you take him out of context, for example, he said one time, love God and sin all you want to. What in the world? But he goes on to say, because if you truly love God, if you've been born again by the grace of God, and you sin one time, that's more than you want to. Your want to has been changed in the gospel. So he would say some things. And so it's perhaps that they've taken Paul's teaching and Paul's quoting back to them what they're saying. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. You know, I mean, you're free to sleep in on Sunday morning. But that doesn't help your soul, and it doesn't help the souls of those looking to you. You're free to go about your day and forget that the saints are gathering at different times. There's nobody going to arrest you for that. The, the synagogue police are not going to come get you. But is it helpful? You're free to live in a culture, but you better be careful that you don't let the culture draw you in. We're free to go into the, to, to this culture to share the gospel, but we better be careful that we don't bring that culture into, into here, into the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a lot of things that we can claim freedom in. The, come into you a book, Shadow of the Cross, Studies in Self-Denial by, by my friend Walter Chantry. It's one of the great reads. It's a little book. It won't take you long to read it. And he says, he makes a statement in there that, that Christian liberty, Christian freedom, the field, he calls it the field of Christian freedom. Because we're not under law as a condemning tool anymore. We're under, under the Ten Commandments as a guide, but not under law to condemn us. He says the field of Christian freedom has a fence around it. And it's the fence of self-denial. Dawson Trotman, in his, in his uh, challenge to people, he was the founder of the Navigators, a great disciple-making organization, said, others may, I cannot. He's talking about Christian freedom, or Christian liberty. Others may, I cannot. So Paul is saying here that not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me. I think he's putting that back in there. But I will not be dominated by anything. In other words, I won't, in the name of freedom, let anything, any vice, any activity, any habit take me captive. Why? Because he's captive to Jesus Christ. You're going to see that here. So this notion uh, that, and it's a, it's a Gnostic idea, G-N-O-S-T-I. So we've talked about the, the Gnostics before, the two branches of them. Uh, the, uh, the docetic Gnostics and the, and the Serentian, not Corinthian, Serentian Gnostics. And they approached uh, two ditches with damnable errors, both of them. But they would talk about how, well, since the, since the body is sinful, well, it really doesn't matter what you do in your body, does, as long as your spirit's clean. That's a branch. Paul's battling with that. So he goes on to say, my life belongs to God. You see, when you, if you profess to be a child of God, if you profess to be saved by grace through faith, would that happen to you when you were 
six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, or whether it happened to you in the last year. We sing, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely, not begrudgingly, freely give, and I don't take it back, by the way. I will ever love and trust him in his presence, daily live. I surrender all. Jesus said, you want to follow me? You want to follow me? He didn't say recite a creed, did he? Though we believe in, in expressing our faith. He didn't say give up this, give up. He said deny yourself. And I'm afraid we've raised a generation of Christians who think they can live indulging themselves and call themselves Christians. And that is just an impossibility. Or else Jesus is a liar or speaks tongue in cheek. So Paul is going to press this. When you, when you became a Christian, you gave up your rights. And boy, that, you, want to get, you want to get stoned today? Go out in public and tell people that. You a Christian? Well, sure I am. You have no rights. Wait a minute. But I'm an American. I can say anything I want to do. I can, I can tear down statues. I can dig up graves. I'm, I can live like I want to. Nope, nope, nope. Mm -mm. Not true. The challenge of living, uh, Jeff prayed earlier, and I, I, I thank, thank God we live in a place where we don't wake up every day. I didn't get up this morning thinking, now I wonder if, if the authorities are going to break in and arrest us today. You don't think that. We live in a wonderful country. The challenge though of living in that kind of freedom is that you become an American who happens to be a Christian rather than a Christian who by God's providence happens to be an American. And there's a difference. There's a considerable difference. So my life belongs to God if I've been saved by grace through faith. That's what Paul says in verses 13 to 17. He goes ahead and quotes something else that apparently was, was going on there. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. Now, so that, that's, that's kind of a, that's kind of a interesting way of saying, and I, you can hear Paul teaching. We're going to get in 1 Corinthians a little later where he goes on specifically about Christian liberty, food offered to idols. And, and you can hear them taking that out of context. Well, look, just, it's just food. Just eat it. And God will destroy both one and the other. In other words, the food you eat isn't going to be any good a few days from now. It served its purpose. And the stomach. You know, your body is going to be destroyed. And then he takes apparently what he goes where they were going with this. Well, if it's just food and it's just a, my body, the body is not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord. And you can almost hear him challenging the Corinthians who extrapolate out. Well, if, if, the, if the body, uh, if food is meant for the stomach and the stomach is just for food, then the body is meant for sex and sex is just for the body. You can, hear them, you can almost hear him saying that. Paul says no. You can't take freedom that far. And yet I've talked to people years ago and within the last few weeks who look me square in the eyes and say, well, I know that it's wrong, but gee, can't I be happy? It's a Corinthian perversion. You love God? Yes, I love God. God says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. God raised the Lord. Notice he appeals to the gospel. And God raised the Lord, that's about Jesus, and will also raise us up by his power. In other words, this is not all there is, folks. Don't live as if this is all there is. If you're a child of God, born again by the, by the uh, blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, as the Spirit applied that to your life, then this is a pretty short window when eternity is taken in view. This is a blink in the mind of God when eternity comes on, on the horizon. When you believe that and you live like that, then you see, you see value in self-denial. But if you, if you live like this is all there is, then you're just going to hang on for all you, you can get. 
God raised the Lord. Do you not know? So, so we've, we've inserted, look here. Do you not know that your bodies, that is your life, your, your physical being as you experience it on earth, are members of Christ? When he says that, that God raised the Lord, that's, the resurrection is in the aftermath of the crucifixion where Jesus dies in the place of sinners. Not know that your bodies are members of Christ? When you said yes to Jesus, when you responded to the conversation and, and, and confessed your sin and acknowledged your trust in Jesus Christ to save you, You've been made a member of Christ. You're, you're, uh, he's the head, Paul will say. We're the members. I'll we'll talk about that when he talks about the gifts in, in, in chapters uh, uh, 12 and 13 and 14. Shall I then take the members of Christ, that is my life, my physical existence, and make them members of a prostitute? What he's, he's using this analogy he's going to, that when you come to Christ, you're joined to Christ spiritually. He uses prostitute here because remember Corinthians, the, the, the town of Corinth is teeming with temple prostitutes. And I have no doubt in my mind that when this letter was read to the church at Corinth, there were women sitting there. There were also male prostitutes, by the way. Men and women sitting there who had been saved by grace through faith out of that false religion. Who had, who had spent their their years as children into adulthood of their bodies being used in the name of worshiping pagan gods. And that's awful anybody would do that. Well, I mean, Oklahoma City is one of the four or five major hubs for trafficking, sex trafficking of children in this country. It's a major intersection of several uh, major highways. People have been busted this past week for this in Tulsa. So shall I take the members of Christ? That was if, if I've confessed faith in Christ, if I've come out of the culture and now I'm a part of the Corinthian church, and then and in the name of freedom, in the name of liberty, join myself to a prostitute? Never. And he uses a strong negation in the Greek. I mean, it's... It's, a, it's, a, it's intense. No way. May it not be, is what it says. May it never be. Or do you not know? So he's using this over 15, 16. Do you not know? It's one of Jesus' favorite expressions to the Pharisees, the legalists. Don't you know? Haven't you read the scriptures? Do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written, and notice here, notice here. This is Paul, remember, thinking in Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You're connected. He says... In another place, while we're looking, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10, God said to, to Paul in that encounter where, where he had that thorn in the flesh, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly, Paul says, of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I'm content with weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul wants them to know that they don't have much time. Don't have, you don't have enough time, folks. Here's the deal. We don't have enough time on this earth to sin freely. Time's running out. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 5. But we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. Interesting. We're not doing Second Corinthians right now, but that's an interesting description. For while we are still in this tent, this body, says, why, why, would, you, why would you give your tent to, to wasteful, foolish, immoral activity? Longing to put on our heavenly... 
For while we're in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. We're going to see that in 1 Corinthians 15. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who's given us the Spirit as our guarantee. You need to see he talks about this, the two shall be one flesh. He's, he's citing Genesis 2.24. Therefore, if a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I think it was F.F. F. Bruce that said that in, that in that consummation of the marriage relationship, in that sexual union of the marriage relationship, it brings, Bruce says, a psychosomatic union, not merely a physical one. You know, we have this term going around today. Friends with benefits. Well, see, friends with benefits is just this culture's way of trying to excuse what the Bible calls fornication. The carrying on between two people, a man and a woman, or in, in contemporary America, a man and a man, or a woman and a woman, are on, and I, well, I've got to stop there, but as if they are in a legitimate married relationship. We talked about this last week, last Sunday night, we were looking at the song of Solomon. Something happens when you join yourself physically in that union, in physical intimacy to another person. There is a swapping of the soul. Part of your soul is given over to that person, and part of that soul is given over to you. It's not, it's not unclaimable, thank God the gospel does that, but it's foolish to head into that sort of experience thinking down the road that'll be reclaimed. It's not guaranteed. What Paul is saying here, the two should become one flesh, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Here's the argument. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've experienced that spiritual union and communion. The dwelling of the Spirit within you. Now he's talked at this point, he's going to summarize it again, about, about our relationship in salvation to God, to Jesus, <clears throat> and to the Spirit. Paul says, if you've experienced that, if you've experienced drinking pure water, my uncle took us years ago up Mount Pettyjean in Arkansas. And we came upon a spring that was bubbling out of the ground. And he had some cups with him, and he had us take that water and drink. And folks, I thought I'd had good water. But that water was just, there was just something amazingly pure, clean. It had a taste. And I drank and I drank and I drank. So if you could experience something like that, why would you go back to ditch water? Why would you go back and go, nah, it's not so bad? No. It says you, you've been joined to the Spirit, in the Spirit with Christ. Why? Why settle for joining yourself in illicit, not, not legitimate, not legitimate husband-wife relationships under God, but in, in illegitimate intimacy that only destroys you and destroys your witness. And so he closes with this. Look at verses 18 to 20. Let me wrap this up. My life is intended to glorify God. We teach our children, and I hope you're teaching your children at home. When they're, when they're a little bitty, you can, I can take you to my little... Uh, two-year-old granddaughter, why? Who made you? God. I said, well, the answer is God made me. Okay, God made me. What else did God make? All things. Yeah, that's all, God made all things. <laughs> why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. And I will pray, dear God, may she grow up believing that she was made for God's glory. <laughs> and when she learns to pronounce it as glory, may that, may that grip her. You see, that's what Paul says here. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. 
but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. He's, he is doing something with his body. And that, that is in the arena of any aspect of sexual immorality. He sins. It, you're, I don't know if I can develop this. You're breaking the sixth commandment. The sixth commandment says you shall not kill. And it means you should not do anything to kill yourself. To kill your soul. And the sixth commandment also teaches you should do everything you can to protect your own life and the life of others. And then he closes. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? You see that Trinitarian you're members of Christ. The Holy Spirit indwells you. See, if I'm saved by grace through faith to that, the Holy Spirit of God indwells me. Same for you. Why would you? And notice he's used the analogy of temple. Why would you then make your temple a place where immorality is expressed? Just as the temple in Corinth, immorality was expressed. whom you have from God. And then he wants to bring it to, you are not your own. Let me say it as kindly as I can. You or anyone else you know who claims to be a Christian but who lives chiefly for themselves is deceived. I didn't say perfectly for themselves. Chiefly for themselves is deceived. You are not your own. Then verse 20, for you were bought with a price. That image there should conjure up slavery for you. I know it's not popular today to talk about that, but brothers and sisters in Christ, we are bond slaves of Jesus Christ. We were set free from the bondage of sin and death to serve the living Savior. And if we think we can come out of the darkness of sin and death and then live any old way we please, setting our agenda our calendar going our way when God has clearly spoken in Scripture and said that is wrong and we are deceived and what's happened is we've played into the hands of the enemy of our souls who does not come like the head turning monster in, in, in the exorcist but who comes as an angel of light saying hey and it's okay it's okay don't take it so seriously. You need this. You deserve this. That's how he comes. And he's luring multitudes of Christians, professing Christians at least, into hell. And he's luring multitudes of Christians astray to be shipwrecked, have their faith shipwrecked. Paul is very concerned about Corinth. We in America today should be very concerned about how much the culture, all the culture has to do is go, <laughs> and we run off like a little puppy dog. And yet we see something clearly taught in the scripture, and they go, oh, well, God, man, that's, man, that's just so hard. The church in America has lost its power because it's lost its biblical convictions and purity. And the world knows when all is said and done that we'll chase them. And what I see coming down the pike for this nation, I said it last week, I'm not a prophet of doom, I've read the end of the book, we win. Let me tell you something, folks. What I'm saying today is hate speech by standards today. The book you're carrying is a hate speech book. You have your Bible with you. And if the church of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't rise up and say, enough, I will not play with the world anymore. I will not follow their whistle. I will rise and say, under God, I will stand. I will not budge. Martin Luther, here I stand, I can do no other, 
God help me. If that doesn't happen to the church in America, to this church, we will be dragged away by the Babylonians into captivity and wonder what in the world, how could this happen? I thought God loved us. He does love us. He loves his son more than he loves us. He loves his name more than he loves us. And when we do not show devotion to his son and honor for his name, we come up on the short end of the stick every time. So don't take what Paul's saying here and say, wow, I'm sure glad I'm not involved in that. No, there's a, it's a mentality in Corinth. And I tell you, it's a mentality that prevails here in the U.S. And I don't want it to prevail in my life. I don't want it to prevail in your life. I don't want it to prevail in this church. You say, man, I'd love to see this church rise with a gospel strength. Well, it's not going to happen as long as we play footsies with the world. Gospel conviction. When I, when I increasingly, and you increasingly say, I am not my own. I don't get to make the decision about that. God has already made that decision, and it's simply mine to say, wherever you lead, I'll go. I will follow. I will follow. I will follow Jesus. Rather than say, well, it's inconvenient to follow Jesus right now, but I'll get around to it. No, 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 no. That's why the church is so impotent today. So I challenge you as I challenge myself. When I read these passages, I think, oh, dear God. I, when I watch that video Wednesday night, if, if you woke up tomorrow with only the things you thank God for today, what would you have? If you woke up tomorrow with only the power attached to your willingness to deny yourself under God today and follow Christ, what strength would you have? Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you in Jesus' name, and we read what Paul says, and we'd like to distance ourselves from that, but dear God, we live in a culture that makes the Corinthian culture look like Sunday school. And so we pray that you would deal with us inside out. Start with me. I don't want to speak as a hypocrite to these people. Lord, cleanse me. Let, let me have enough of being caught up in this culture and rise to say, by God's grace and His Spirit indwelling me, here I stand. And I want my life to count for God. When it's all been said and done and my children and my grandchildren stand around my casket I, and these precious brothers and sisters here, church family, I don't want anybody to be scratching their head wondering, well, did he, did he live his life for Jesus? But I don't want that to happen to anyone here who, who names the name of Christ. Help us to leave a spiritual legacy that our children can follow that our grandchildren can have pointed to them. This is what it's like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Help us not to fizzle out. Help us not to quit, <laughs> to give up on your word before we finish, Lord. I pray for those here who are not yet followers of Jesus Christ or those who, who have claimed that and are self-deceived that you would break in with the gospel of a crucified and risen Savior and by your Spirit save to your glory, to glorify you with our bodies, with our lives, with our time, our talents, our gifts, to glorify you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.